There we go. So right. I would say let's just get started if that's okay with everyone, since at least we're going to get our beautiful recording of this. Um, so because it's not that many of us, feel free to sort of like raise your hands and talk. Uh, it's probably going to be just as easy. But I'm going to start. So today we're going to have we're going to be talking with Bryce and with Lucy about public procurement, which is a really interesting topic that is not that explored. So I think it's really important. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, as you probably heard with all the drama, it is being recorded. So if for whatever reason you're not comfortable with the recording or if you want to just have your name not appear there, change your name. All you have to do is rename yourself and you won't be there. So that's fine. Other than that, I think that it's just a general, it's sort of like a very relaxed conversation that we're going to be having with Lucy and Bryce. So again, feel free to either ask questions through Mentimeter. Joanna has shared the link, but she'll probably share it again in a wee while. Uh, but just in case you're wondering about how to share a Mentimeter, how to ask questions to the Mentimeter, all you have to do is click on the link that we're going to put or go to menti.com and use the code that we're going to be uh, putting in a second. And then you just have to go and ask questions. You're going to be able to upvote them there. You're going to be able to just ask them by opening that Q&A that will pop up in any of your devices. So as we move along, you should be able to see those. So if that's okay with everyone, I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can have all the lovely faces as big as possible. And uh, we're gonna start with Lucy talking a little bit about public procurement. Then we're gonna to move to Bryce who has the coolest story about how to turn around a dairy. And then we're gonna be talking about how they work together to make sure that that amazing meal actually makes it to the children in Ayrshire. So Lucy, the floor is yours. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them there. But again, because we're a small group, you can also raise your hand and we'll go to you. Lucy, all yours. Thank you, Anna. I'm gonna share my screen. So if anyone raises their hand and I don't see it, then just feel free to chip in because I might miss it. Um, okay. So hopefully you can all see that. Can you see that now, presentation mode? Yes, it's perfect. Yes, great. Um, so, as Anna said, uh, my name is Lucy Wardle. I'm the Supply Chain Officer at Food for Life Scotland. Um, and I'm just going to go through a little bit today about the programme Food for Life um, and how we do work with suppliers and producers in Scotland um, to try and take advantage of the route to market that is public procurement. And Bryce is a shining example of that. So I'm really glad that he's here to talk about it today. Um, so what is public procurement? I'm sure that you all know this, um, but just in case um, someone doesn't, um, it refers to the purchase of goods and services um, by governments, local authorities and government agencies. So it's really anything you could think of that you might see in a hospital, a school, a police station. So it covers you know, basically everything. Um, but what we're talking about today is food um, and the food that's served in local authority settings, in particular schools. Um, so why is it important? Well, it's really, really important because it is spending public money on public goods. So it really is the perfect opportunity to invest that public money back into the local community, into local businesses to benefit local people. So that means putting the money back into the local economy, creating jobs, creating training opportunities and apprenticeships, um, and really taking advantage of homegrown produce, seasonal food, um, reducing food miles, reducing imports, and really investing in Scotland's businesses. So it is a huge opportunity because every year in Scotland, the public sector spends about £150 million on food and drink. Um, that figure actually is a couple of years old now, so it's probably a lot more than that. Um, but it, it's a huge figure and a great opportunity to channel that money back into local businesses. So a little bit about what Food for Life served here actually is and how we work with local authorities and suppliers. Um, so it's a programme that is run by Soil Association and in Scotland we are funded by the Scottish Government. Um, so I just work with local authorities and suppliers in Scotland, but the programme is UK wide. So there's people working on, on this project um, up and down the UK. Um, and it's backed by uh, annual inspections for the caterers and it's really about trying to encourage and reward caterers who are really pushing their school meals further. And um, 
it centers around serving fresh food, serving more environmentally sustainable and ethical food. So that's organic, higher welfare products like free range, um, and also making healthy eating easier and championing local food producers, which is what we're talking about today. So here is a map of where we um, work across Scotland. So at the minute we have 17 local authorities um, on the Food for Life Served Here Award. So that's over half of the local authorities in Scotland, um, which means over 100,000 meals a day are being served in Scotland that are Food for Life certified. That means we have um, you know, the ability to help support those local authorities with their supply and help guide them to work with local suppliers. So it's a huge, huge um, opportunity. So a little bit more of information um, of how we work across the supply chain. So we work all the way from producers to suppliers, manufacturers, distributors to the local authorities and also kind of stakeholders that work across the whole supply chain and the whole landscape of public food, really. So with local authorities, um, we really work hard to identify opportunities for them to increase the Scottish sourcing um, on their menu. So we look at what they're buying, what's not Scottish and what could be Scottish. And we also look to increase higher welfare products, um, increase products obviously from Scottish SMEs and support and facilitate the supply chain pilot projects. We also troubleshoot and problem solve any kind of supply chain related issues that they might have just to provide that extra bit of support. And we celebrate success stories. So we have a communications team. We do a lot of comms and PR around great success stories and um, with local producers and Scottish sourcing. Now with the suppliers, we help link them up with councils and um, finding new routes to market for them and finding business opportunities. Um, and this means facilitating projects with local authorities and using data analysis to advise on things like volumes and demand to try and kind of get to the nitty gritty of those agreements to, to help support all parties really. And it's all about developing new markets for Scottish suppliers and driving demand for more local food and higher standards of food as well. And we also signpost to other support available and highlight opportunities that are coming up for contracts. And then with industry stakeholders, um, we, we really work to raise the profile of the public sector as a route to market. And we collaborate to support local authorities and suppliers to use more Scottish, more um, high quality food in school meals. So the benefits, why are we asking local authorities to get more local food into their school meals? There's many, many benefits. Um, part of it really is that the Food for Life standards that are involved in the Food for Life Served Here Award. There's a couple of standards around suppliers. And so we ask for local authorities to um, display the provenance of their food. So where their food is coming from on the menu. And we also ask them to use more seasonal food. Um, which obviously encourages more local supply and to work with local suppliers and really celebrate that wherever possible. So it's providing a valuable route to market for producers and it's a big part of community wealth building, um, which has become a really kind of popular phrase at the moment. It's been used a lot by um, government, by local authorities, and it's, it's a term that's kind of being, being used to, to think about the green recovery and how we can kind of champion um, our, our local suppliers. But really, buying local food is a core, um, kind of a core value of community wealth building. It's about channeling that money back into the community to, to build it up. And it's really connecting people with where their food is coming from. Um, which is so important, especially in children, and it's building their understanding of, of food. Um, so seasonal and local food in school meals is normalising this kind of eating for children, and it's building their positive food culture. So if they're having these foods at school, they might go home and tell their parents that that's what they want. You know, they might, as they grow up, kind of it will cement in them the, the importance of, of eating local and seasonal food. And also, you know, we, we know that long and complex supply chains are very fragile and they are really susceptible to disruption and shocks. So we've seen that with Brexit. Um, we've seen that with, you know, COVID and kind of adverse weather events like the Beast from the East. Um, that actually these long kind of retail type um, 
supply chains the supermarkets use you know they call it just in time and they try and get things just at the last minute so they can keep their shelves full well that model doesn't really work when there's any kind of disruption um, but what we've seen from our local authorities who use more um, kind of Scottish and local suppliers is actually they're a lot more reliable when anything disrupts the supply chain. So we did a series of, of um, case studies at the beginning of the pandemic with local authorities to understand about their supply and, and what was happening there. And they all said that their local suppliers were absolute champions and that they couldn't have um, you know done it without them. And that's because it's a smaller businesses, they were able to pivot to what was needed very, very quickly. So that was um, usually it was pivoting from school meals and supplying huge, you know, hospitals and, and big local authority settings to supplying um, emergency food packages for the community. And the local authorities really, really supported um, the, the local suppliers really supported the local authorities with that. So that is very, very important um, that we remember that that benefit of using smaller suppliers. So I couldn't resist putting this picture of Bryson, <laughs> looking very happy there. Um, so benefits for suppliers, it provides a really valuable route to market and helps them to really diversify their, their market and take charge of where their product is going to. Local authorities use long-term contracts, so it's quite reliable and it helps businesses to plan ahead. Um, and they're usually two years minimum that local authorities usually add on an extra one year or two years and if it's all going well it'll just keep rolling on. Um, payment terms are reliable, Bryce can talk about this, hopefully they have been for you, but local authorities have a, have a 30 day payment term and they're very reliable on that front. It also builds that connection with the local people and can expand your customer base. So if kids are having this, uh, you know, their food at school, they might see it at, you know, the, the local shop and uh, they'll know that they'll know that and they'll um, know that it's coming from their local area. And it also, as I said, gives gives more control to the producer or the farmer and it helps retain more power in the supply chain, which is sadly um, very often lost for um, primary producers. So it all sounds great to this point, but I can't um, deny that there are some challenges and barriers. Um, so it can be very, very valuable and worthwhile, but securing a contract can take a long time. Um, it can be a slow burn and they don't come up that often. So um, it's definitely something to be thinking about um, you know, over a longer period of time. And the tendering process does involve quite a lot of paperwork. It's a complex um, system at the moment. Obviously, it is possible and there's a lot of support out there um, for suppliers getting involved, but um, it, it is a little bit of, of work. Uh, also, the school year is only 38 weeks of the year. So you really need a market for your, for your product the rest of the year. So you need to think about that. And then there's the logistics and delivery of supplying lots of schools in your local area. Um, also just a more general barrier that I, I've seen is that there's a lack of processing facilities in, in Scotland. Um, so when we're looking at keeping things especially like vegetables in Scotland and supplying them to their local um, authorities, it can be quite hard because the product needs to go away somewhere further afield to get processed and come back. So that's something that is being developed on, on a wider scale and needs more support, but it's just you know something that does come up so through Food for Life, we work on a couple of different ways of, of finding that route to market. And as a supplier, there's a few different things that you can do. So we work on um, quite a lot of pilot projects. So this is just an idea that comes up um, and we can usually test that out with a local authority and a supplier without having to actually do a formal contract. It depends on the value. If it's a lower value, then this is possible. And that's really just allows us to kind of test it out, use a bit of trial and error to see what, what works. And, and that's by far the most kind of straightforward way to test out a new idea. Um, and that can be anything. I mean, we work with suppliers who are just supplying one product or just one school or a couple of schools, depending on you know, the regional um, area, or it could be supplying a whole local authority or the whole of Scotland. There's so many different options and every local authority works um, differently, but it's always worth, you know, if you have any ideas or anyone wants to get involved in supplying into public procurement, then it's, it's always good to kind of ask and um, talk to us about it.
Then there's also local authority contracts. So this is the route that Bryce went through, so he can tell you more about that. Um, but that's when local authorities advertise their own contracts for working in their local authority area. And then there's also Scotland Excel Framework. So this is an organisation that works on behalf of all 32 of the local authorities and they procure on behalf of them. So they have lots of um, frameworks, for all of the kind of big food groups. Um, and you can use those frameworks to tender for one local authority or for the whole of Scotland. There's lots of different options there and lots of geographical lotting. But the local authority contracts and the Scotland Excel frameworks can all be found on Public Contracts Scotland on the website. I've put the link there. Um, so that's where you can kind of have a look at what's available, what's coming up. Um, and they also put notices of, of um, future contracts on there. There's also the Supplier Development Programme which is a free resource for suppliers and it's really really great it, it has so much content on there so that's the website for the supplier development program they do loads of events they do training courses um, and they're really there to to support suppliers to get involved with public procurement so i've got a little example here of a pilot project um, as I, I mentioned, so this is one with Woodside Arran, which is um, obviously on the Isle of Arran, a small supplier, and it all came from the idea that they were already supplying the, the local community on Arran, and they really wanted to get involved with um, the local authority and supply into schools. So it just came from a small idea and they contacted us and, and just kind of said that they were, they were interested in it. We facilitated that with North Ayrshire Council, and that has um, kind of now grown. So they are supplying the seven primary schools, the high school and a care home with vegetables and seasonal fruit um, and free range eggs. And the, the approach that they have, it's community supported agriculture. It's very sustainability focused. Um, and since starting that project, they've had a lot of attention. We did some press on them. Their, their case study was actually used in the community wealth building strategy by North Ayrshire Council as an example of, of what can be done and really best practice. Um, and they've hired more people. They've got a lot more funding. So it's really helped them. Um, and it's been a great opportunity for them. Another example, this one's a little bit different. Um, this is just to kind of highlight how when local authorities join the Food for Life um, Served Here Award, it opens up more opportunities for local supply. So one of the standards within the award is that local authorities must commit to serving only meat um, from farms that satisfy UK, UK animal welfare standards. So quite often local authorities, before they join the award, they'll be buying meat from abroad, um, with no animal welfare. So when they when they join, they need to, you know, have, have UK animal, animal welfare assured meat. So with that one standard, it just converts their whole spend to more local spend. Um, so this is a, an example from West Lothian Council. From when they joined, um, they, after one year of holding the, the bronze award, 95% of their fresh butcher meat and 88% of all of their meat was, was sourced from within Scotland. So that means it was using um, Scottish farmers, Scottish um, suppliers, and it was all Scotch beef PGI, Scotch lamb PGI, and specially selected pork. So that's really giving that level of assurance um, and as well using the local suppliers and Scottish farmers. So that's just one, you know, one thing um, to show how the, the standards can really make a huge change. So, um, there was my email address if anyone wants any more information um, or wants to chat more about public procurement and routes to market then you're very free to get in touch with me. Um, also we have a lot um, more information on the website and case studies and um, examples of public procurement and kind of supplier success stories. So I will stop talking now. Um, and hand back over. So thankfully we have Bryce here who is a, a living example of um, a success story. So it'd be good to, to hear more from him. The living example is here and the living example who's uh, also a third generation farmer is gonna tell us all about how he turned around his farm uh, and just his experience in Moskiel farm which has an amazing, amazing story. So Bryce, all yours, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so I suppose my story really starts in 2013. Um, at that time, my father and my grandfather were both farming at um, Westminster Farm, 
They had 150 Ayrshire and Holstein uh, cross cattle. Um, the cattle were housed 365 days of the year, and they were actually one of the highest yielding herds in the country at the time. My father was a, a very into his pedigrees um, and trying to, to stay stay relevant in the, the modern farming sort of area um, as a tenant farmer, trying to get as much milk out of the cows as possible to get as much back and keep his cost down as, as low as he could. Um, in 2013, I was a mechanic for Mercedes-Benz. Um, I had no interest in farming at all. Uh, I was born on the farm, but just didn't see a career path um, in, in the industry. However, I got a phone call one day. My father and my grandfather had both been diagnosed with terminal illnesses within a month of each other. Um, I got my father had terminal cancer. My grandfather had a terminal heart condition. And uh, initially, I come home for, for just a few weeks to try and kind of see what I could help my family and, and kind of get, get my head around what we were going to do uh, with the farm. Um, as I was back, my father had, uh, sorry, my grandfather had died a few weeks later, and uh, I kind of fell in love with the farm again, remembering everything I enjoyed about it when I was young. Um, and I kind of thought to myself, you know, I can maybe make a go at this and see see how it goes. Um, Dad died about a year later, um, so you can picture the scene. I was, uh, you know, t- twelve months knowledge about farming and um, didn't really know anything other than the way that dad and papa had done it because I didn't pay attention when I was younger and I certainly wasn't paying attention in the 10 years I was at Mercedes-Benz and um, so we were milking three times a day uh, pushing as hard as we could and then the milk price collapsed and uh, we went from getting 30 pence a litre for our milk to 15 and then nine and a half uh, within a few months of that so my, my first year in farming I was sitting at the end of the year with the accountant being told I'd lost 150,000 pounds and the next day, the bank manager decided that uh, we were no longer a viable business and my inexperience wasn't going to sort things out. So they called back all the date. So it sort of left in the position where we had very little income, we were losing a lot of money, and anything we owned was either uh, cows or machinery. So I decided that, uh, that we would sell anything we could to try and keep the farm going, but I didn't really know where to come from there. So we reduced it down to 28 cows, and these 28 cows were the ones that no one wanted to buy. Um, so they either weren't calved, they weren't producing much milk other than their own pedigree. And, uh, and then my milk buyer decided that we were too small to lift milk from anymore. So we were left with a farm who didn't know which direction to go in and 28 cows which weren't producing enough milk to sell in the open market. So uh, this bright idea that I would do for my, my papa did uh, when he was my age at 28 years old, and he would have had a small amount of cows, he would have sold his milk directly to the local community. And I always remember my gran and grandpa telling me that those times were hard, but they were able to make a living. They always had a job to do, but it was a great way of life and they were able to raise a family. So that's, that, was a, that was a sort of vision back then. Um, and as time went on and I sat, started to research what Papa did, I realised that what he did in 1948 in the farm was basically what organic farmers did today. Uh, the difference was we had a digital age and we, we, we knew all the issues that we had in 1948 and how to overcome them without using chemical fertilizer sprays and, and having direct conversations and direct relationships with our customers. Uh, so we decided to become organic and this was in 2016. Um, going through the organic process was really quite difficult for us. We had a farm that had been farmed for 30 years with a lot of fertilizers and sprays and to the vision of pumping a lot of milk out from all these cows. Um, and I was going the exact opposite way, so I had a lot of learning to do. However, at each step of the way, I was very open on social media with our local community about what we were doing and asking them if they would support us in the change, and they did. Um, so much so that by 2018, and the first day we became organic, and the 1st of July, we actually ran out of milk. We didn't have enough milk to sell to our local community. Um, but this time, our local community was the villages around the farm, but also because we were pasteurising the milk in a very slow way, in a very traditional and old-fashioned way, from very traditional and old-fashioned cattle. It worked very well in speciality coffee, which ended up going into the Glasgow market and the Edinburgh market. So by this time, we were actually speaking to other farmers to ask if we could buy their milk for a price that they set, not but set, not a price set by the industry, so that we could then process it and deliver it up to Glasgow. So we then ran out of the milk of the second farm by the August that year and the third farm by the December. So we decided that to, to have sustainable growth, we would have to tie in with a farming cooperative. So we tied in with OMSCO, they're the largest farming cooperative in the UK. And luckily, because we're in Ayrshire, we're right bang in the middle of all the organic milk fields as well. So we were able to tie in with five organic farms and we were really wanting to, to sort of take what we, had, what we had learned over the past few years and sort of spread it out more. So instead of us just trying to save our family farm, we actually had an idea that 
we could bring old fashioned milk and old fashioned thinking with very short supply chains back to the market that we have. Um, and of course, that was I started looking at other markets we could enter. And the one place that always I always sort of stumbled upon was the fact that local schools weren't using local produce anymore. And um, and at that time, we were actually the only dairy in Ayrshire that was that was supplying milk as well. So I kind of thought to myself, it's a bit of a shame that we've got all these schools and all these farms right in the middle of, of Ayrshire, and we weren't able to do anything about it. But at that time, I hadn't put two and two together to see what we could do about it because. As, as far as I knew, it was just too difficult to get into to public procurement. And it wasn't until I was actually asked to speak at a, Scot a Scottish Parliament event um, run by Food for Life, by the Soil Association. Um, and I was actually stood next to um, one of the, the tenderers of East Ayrshire at the time. And I, I kind of said my piece and said, oh, it'd be great to get milk back into schools. And they stood up and said, oh, it'd be great to get local milk into schools. And we kind of clicked and went, oh, well, you know, there might be something in it here. Um, so that was when I got in touch with Lucy initially. Um, there was another one of the farmers at suppliers. They had, um, had managed to initiate the meeting, and we kind of realised that the, the, the thinking was turning. Um, luckily, the, the the council that we are in, East Ayrshire, was already a gold food for life standard holding authority, and uh, they were kind of they were using organic milk from another supplier, which was was Scottish, and they were able to use the, the they were able to gain the, the gold certification. But we had to do something different ourselves, you know, as we couldn't just go and say, look, we're an organic farm, we can supply your milk. We had to think outside the box and go, right, how do we do this better to get local milk back into local schools? So it's not just organic, it's it's local, it's benefiting the local community, it's local milk from local people for local people. And that was the big vision that we had. Um, but also as, as part of the wider business at Miss Neil, we had a passion to not only just be organic, we wanted it to be zero waste and we wanted to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and back in 2018, this was something that was very difficult to do because believe it or not, it, although 2018 is only three years ago, that we were only really starting to think in the mainstream about our plastic use. The carbon footprint uh, uh, argument was always at the back of the at the back of the conversation. It was never at the fore like it is, and even just the past six months, it's been incredible the change in it. And people were still not thinking about local food. It wasn't really until 2019, 2020, pandemic times, that people were really starting to focus on these things. Uh, so it really got us thinking about what we could do. So in 2019, we announced we would become single-use plastic free. Uh, we only use reusable containers, glass bottles and, and buckets and churns. Um, and at the end of 2019, we announced that we were going to be carbon neutral by 2025. And then we were very delighted to see that East Ayrshire were about to launch a tender for the, the milk supply to all the primary schools. Um, and that was when we really started thinking, you know, we could really have a, have a go at doing this, but how do we tie it together? So we took our vision of being single-use plastic free, organic, and driving down our carbon footprint, and had to think about how we could fill this tender in to actually you know, be noticed to be the, the, the winning tender bidder and, uh, and actually create real change for our local community and get local milk back into schools. So the idea that we had was that we could supply milk to schools in milk vending machines. So we would supply the milk in buckets that they'd be poured into a milk vending machine and the pupils could then use a reusable cup to get the milk um, from, from the machine itself. So that drives out the single-use plastic. It also, at the other end, it drives down the, the council's waste bill because they no longer have a recycling fee for all these plastic milk, uh, plastic milk bottles to go. Um, and then the, the biggest benefit was we've actually worked out that the amount of plastic we'd be saving was in the region of 1.4 million pieces per year by not supplying single-use plastic. So we did all the calculations and presented that to the council. So the next issue we had was with the organic milk supply to keep food for life. Well, thankfully, right from the conception of Ms. Neil, we always said we're only going to supply 100% organic milk and we've continued that to this day. So we were able to tick that box as well. And the final box was the carbon emissions. Now, as a, as a business, uh, where greenhouse gas emissions were high because of the lower amount of milk we were doing. So if you compare the litre of our milk to a mass produced litre of milk, it was very high. However, we are trying to drive that down and we knew that we were going to be investing in renewable technology. But more importantly, the, one of the largest parts of where our greenhouse gas emissions came from was the delivery of the milk, because when we're doing multiple drops around about these schools, start, stop all the time. The highest emissions from a diesel van is when you start, stop. So we actually found out that by not using single-use plastic, the amount of money we'd be saving in our variable costs would allow us to spend the extra money on electric vehicles and the vending machines. It was that significant of, of a cost. So because we could look at it holistically, we're actually able to supply milk to the schools at a level that we believe was competitive with the previous supplier 
but also drive out single-use plastic and drive our greenhouse gas emissions down. And of course, in August, we found that we were living tender for it, so we were delighted to have that. Um, and even bigger news, just last night, we were told that the, the council believes it's going so well, they've now given us the nursery contract as well as of January, so we're delighted to get that as well. So it's um, certainly brilliant for us, and uh, we're very grateful to, to the Food for Life programme to, to, to be running these sort of systems so that we're able to have a chance in it. So it's been fantastic. That's an amazing story. I just love it. Thank you, Bryce. Um, Lucy, I mean, Bryce painted a very sort of like organized, straightforward. He had an idea. He managed to make it work. Can you talk about the more complicated aspects maybe of going through the public procurement? Because, I mean, listening to Bryce, I think that everybody would be like, eh, it feels like a no-brainer. But there must be a reason why it's not a no-brainer. Well, I mean, Bryce really did all the hard work. I can't claim to do that much, um, really, apart from bring the the two parties together. So yeah, it was it just it kind of came from the beginning. Bryce saying he was really interested in this, um, and that's really what we need is suppliers to say, actually, I'm interested. I want to explore this. So that's how it started. And then, yeah, engaging with the council um, and I facilitated a meeting with um, a couple of people from the council and actually took them down to see Bryce at his farm, um, which I thought was really great to kind of get them out of the office and get them actually onto a farm and looking at, you know, the, the impact um, of where they're buying their food. Um, so that was that was really useful. But, you know, as Bryce said, it, it does take a while and you are waiting for those opportunities to come up. And, you know, it's the, the tender process does have um, quite a few boxes to tick. So I'd say from my point of view, for what we offer at Food for Life is really the opportunity to connect with the local authorities and actually talk to them. So you're not just kind of an anonymous, just a, a name on a form. You're actually a person and this is your business and this is why you're passionate about supplying uh, local food. And so I think it's really helpful for the council to see that um, and buy in into that really rather than just kind of a, a faceless operation <laughs> fair enough um bryce from your perspective uh, how much did you have to work with the council or how how does those relations sort of like um work out through time you said that you were lucky enough to be by the person that was actually sourcing for uh the council and everything so how much does that personal contact play into being able to uh have a successful or uh, offer on the table? Uh, yep, so during the tender, the tender process, um, I suppose, well, I, I think I'm going to deputy your question right anyway. D during the tender process, you're not able to actually contact the council for any advice or, or even talk to them at all. Um, it's all the information is on the tender documents. And if you have a, a question relating to the tender documents themselves, you have to then raise that question, which is then answered within the, the document. So it's, it's, to us, it's a very fair system. It's a very complicated and very long drawn out system, but it is very fair. Um, so it, it didn't give us any step up as a business over any of the larger producers. Um, where, where we found a lot of benefit from was that the tenor documents are very open. So they give you a lot of information about volume, about where, about locations to, to where they've dropped. So from our perspective, it's, it was a massive, a massive opportunity, but also a massive amount of work. I think there was about three of us in the business just looking at it constantly for a couple of weeks just to try and work out how to do it best, especially with the complexity of offering the zero waste and, and lower emissions um, situation there as well, because it wasn't a standard document we were filling out. Um, so yes, I mean, the, 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 the council's there, the, the tender documents are very clear. However, it is a very long drawn out process and uh, we did need a lot of help from, uh, from, from a few consultants and, and a lot of people in the team here just to get it right. Um, when we found out we had uh, when the tender, it was you know it was absolute chaos. We had, I think we had uh, ten days to to get from find from actually been given the go ahead that we've got the the tender to get the milk into the schools. I believe COVID played quite a big part in that. I think there was a lot of delays because of COVID, so I don't think that's a standard thing. But it's only what I've ever done, so I don't know. Um, but we only had ten days, so we basically had to go and have meetings with the, the this, all, all of the kind of management. And the tender management people at East Ayrshire Council and we found the best way to go ahead was actually to get all the catering staff together and I would do some presentations. So I, get, I did some presentations in three different schools with all the catering managers just to explain who we were, why we were going to be different, the, the, you know, the, the challenges and the benefits of working with a, a smaller local supplier. And I think that, that 
that particular thing, that key meeting that we had, I think that was the best thing we could have done because you know if, if you if you can imagine you're, you're a catering manager, you've got say 10 to 20 staff in a kitchen and all of a sudden your two litre plastic milk bottle that every single person knows is replaced by a five litre bucket that you have to wash out and sit out for a small business to come and collect, you know, I think that was a, a bit a key a key area for the for the, the so far the success of, of the tender and the success of the contract so far. Um, because the first time I went to school, I'd, I went in personally and I dropped off the milk and I had some very unhappy catering staff in front of me who didn't understand the reuse idea and didn't understand why things were changing. Um, so the communication was absolute key for, for the process and the situation we've done. Um, and then also we've, we've adapted as well. So one of the complaints was that the buckets we use, the type of buckets we use, which we've used for the past three years in coffee shops and cafes, a lot of the, the catering staff really didn't like them. So I ended up adjusting the... How these how these operate, and we gave them a little tool to open the buckets, and everything's happy again. So again, what we say to them is keep the communication lines up. You know, we're, we're a small business here, but we're, we're not a faceless company. We're not going to turn around and say, well, this is the way it is, and that's it. But you know, we want to work with catering staff to make sure we get it right, so that we can expand as a business, hopefully into the we're neighbouring local authorities. And if not, then we can support other small businesses as like us to, to do the same. Here's a few questions for the audience that I think are interesting. Um, the first one is if there's a best value element that takes into account the other benefits and reduce external costs uh, in the consider regarding the bidding for the council contract, whether you had a just price for the milk or you had that best value element going around. Uh, so, so in the tender that we had, um, so I, th I think I'm interpreting the question right anyway. So in, in the tender we had, there was a certain percentage of the tender was going to be scored on the price, and a certain percentage was going to be service, and a certain percentage was going to be in quality. So when you're filling out the tender, there's I can't remember the amount. I think it was maybe fourteen or fifteen different questions to answer, um, and each question's weighted differently on either price, quality, or service. So we knew that we were roughly in the ballpark with it with the price, not because the council told us that, but we just because we knew the market. So we knew we were going to be roughly in the ballpark there, so we had to win in service and quality. So we, had, we knew that particular parts of service we couldn't win on because we didn't have the logistics side of the business as big as our competitors. And we knew that on the quality side, we didn't have uh, accreditations like BRC or Salsa, so we had to use all the questions and answer them in a certain way to show that our benefits across to the council so that we weren't just going to say that, oh, well, you know, we can maybe compete in price, but everything else doesn't really matter. We had to really think about how we answered. Um, and again, you know, we, we spoke to consultants about that to, to make sure that we did it right, because, you know, it's leaning in these people is how we, how we managed to, to successfully get us there. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just add to that as well, um, that I think historically it's been seen that public procurement, they're looking for the cheapest food and that it's just a commodity and, you know, whatever they can get. Um, rather than the actual quality and the added benefits. But now it is, it is the kind of common practice on all tenders that they include um, community benefits as well, which gives you the chance to talk about other ways that you are benefiting the local authority. So price definitely does pay, play a huge part because local authorities are very pushed on budgets. But it's about, as Bryce has said, taking that opportunity to actually really blow your own trumpet in any way you can on that tender document and add all of those extra details and everything that kind of comes along as an added community benefit, but also an added benefit for, you know, ev everything you can think of from the, the reduction of waste to the electric vehicles. Um, and all of those things are very important to councils. So I think that's really key that suppliers um, really have to kind of look at it as an opportunity to add in all of those extra really valuable pieces of information on the tender. Following on that, um, is there a sort of like particular push from the councils for a certain amount of local food or is it in general just they could, whatever they can get their hands on, they would take or how does it work? And then associated with that, how do the social benefits or the community benefits related to them play into this whole mega complicated <laughs> process of applying? Well, definitely from um, the kind of aspect of food for life so local authorities who are food for life um, served here awarded they do you know they are abiding by those standards I mentioned in my presentation that look around kind of provenance and local suppliers and seasonality so probably 
local authorities who hold the award might be more motivated to look for those kind of benefits from their suppliers so it does open up more opportunities and also you know we're here the food for life team are there to support the local authorities in finding those kind of opportunities in their local area um but I think for all local authorities, it's becoming more and more important and people are realising really the benefits of using local producers. And also, you know, as I said, community wealth building is being talked about all the time um, in Parliament. It's there's kind of community wealth building bills being drawn up at the minute and all local authorities are looking for ways to demonstrate their support for the local um, the local economy and their local community. So I think it's just becoming more and more important for all of the, the local authorities. Here's a question for the two of you, uh, and it's quite, it's probably quite open, so feel free to answer it however you want, but I think it's an important one, and it's, uh, why do you think that farmers need to participate more directly in public procurement? It's something that farmers probably don't necessarily think is even there. Why should they participate in it? Well, I think Bryce will probably have uh, the, the real valuable answer on this. But from um, from my point of view, I think it's just giving farmers the opportunity to diversify their markets and to actually take the power back, take charge of actually what they want to do with their product, where they want it to go, who they want their consumers to be, um, rather than it being lost throughout a really long and complex supply chain where the value is lost, where they're squeezed for prices. Um, so I think it's really about kind of returning to the way that our food system should be, which is that the producers are retaining more of the power, more of the profit, um, rather than that being lost throughout a supply chain. Um, so that's my point of view. But what do you think, Bryce? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you, Lucy. Yep. Um, I mean, the, the, the facts that always scare me, every, every year there's a, a report comes out in the Herald Scotland and it talks about the amount of dairy farms left in Scotland, the amount of cows that are left and the average cows per farm. And every single year, the amount of farms left has gone down and the amount of cows is staying the same and the average number per farm is going up. So I think when I first started farming, it was about 160 cows per farm and now it's over 220. So, you know, that, that's a sign to me that, that small family or, or small independent farms are now just, they're all going by the wayside. There's a huge talk of rewilding at the minute and uh, a, lot, a lot of landowners are holding onto land to start selling it for trees or start selling it for, for carbon sequestration. And again, that's putting tenant farmers out, it's putting small farmers out. Um, people are, you know, it's, it, it just seems to me that the, the whole system's broken. Um, me personally, I've got this vision where we can do something as a milk processor to work with small family farms. And the one thing that really touched me was about three years ago, um, the second farmer that started supplying, or the second family farm that started supplying us, um, they'd been supplying us for about a fortnight. And at that time, we were able to, but we were small enough to keep all the milk separately. So we're selling milk from Mosquito Farm, selling milk from Wesley Bray Farm, and selling milk from Drums Modern Farm. And there was a, cu a customer had put a thing up on Facebook and said, um, I got drum, drum smudding milk today and I made custard and it's by far the best customer I've ever, ever made in my life. And the farmer phoned me up about 20 minutes after that, went on there, so he was obviously watching it. And he said, I've been a farmer for 30 years and it's the first time anyone has ever said anything about the produce that I make. So it really kind of struck, really kind of struck a chord with me that, you know, there's something in this. Um, if I should farmers go to public procurement, I think that, that we really need to, to look at small family farms or, or, or traditional family farms in a way that can be sustainable going forward. I think that there should be access to local markets and local public, uh, uh, local authority and public public um, establishments really can be key to that. Because you know, like it's all very well having ten different farms supplying into a few that a few small villages. But, you know, there's, there's going to be different sizes of farms there. There could be farms doing butter, there could be farms doing yogurt, there could be farms doing beef. And then the, the one at the end of the road that's got a slightly bigger processing capacity there could be the one supplying the local authorities with the milk that's, that's left over from the rest of them. You know, it's, I think it's, it's a, really, a really exciting time to be involved in what we are. And I think with the, with the world watching us, I think uh, we need to crack on and go on with it. Based on that, you're working with a lot of, a lot of other farmers. Um, so I guess that it kind of highlights the responsibility of what happens with the produce when you don't have the schools. What happens with, how, how do you manage those downtimes when you don't have the schools as sort of like a market? Well, as a challenge and that challenge for us, we're very fortunate to work with the, 
the Omsco Cooperative. So during these times that, that the milk's, milk demand dips or increases, we can then work with the cooperatives to, for milk to go elsewhere into different markets. So for example, if the liquid milk market goes down because people aren't taking as much for, for schools or for coffee shops or things like that, then it can perhaps go to cheese or go to other products and things. So we're very lucky to be tied in with the co-op. And that's one of the reasons we are tied in with the co-op. Um, four years ago, before we started working with OMSCO, we did have this situation where we could, you know, we were one farm supplying a market. So Christmas times is the, Christmas time is the time that I think is absolutely crazy. You've got three weeks of absolutely crazy demand, and then for two weeks you get nothing. You can barely sell a litre of milk. So during that time, we were very busy up until Christmas, and then nothing. So we actually tied in with a local artisan cheese maker, and they started up their production of cheese between Christmas and New Year. And then we would buy the cheese back from them January, February time to then sell to the cafes during the you know, j during the next year. So, um, so it worked very well with that. Unfortunately, when a business, um, but I'll say, but we're now tied in the Obscure who do something very similar, but on a much larger scale. Um, but yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge for, for those particular things, particularly with schools. Um, and especially if you're, if you're smaller and don't have the option of uh, being able to diversify in the way that we can. However, it's, uh, it's something that we battle with every day, uh, not just in term time now. So it's, uh, you, you, learn to get, you learn to live with it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, let me see what another question. Right. So there's one question is how the farmers, white farmers should be involved. How can they get involved? Um, I'm going to start with Bryce and then go to you. See, how do you think they could get more involved? Would you would you sort of like recommend following your path or do you think there's other paths that can be followed based on your experience? Um, I don't think I would I would really recommend my path at all. <laughs> yeah, that too, too many sleepless nights. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, now it's a very different world now than it was six years ago when we started. Um, I mean, there is an awful lot more support out there. Um, there's a lot of support, and unfortunately, I think the support's not marketed very well. Um, a lot of local authorities are promoting small businesses to be able to do things. There's a lot of different schemes and, and pots of money out there to be, to be taken in. Um, there's, there's also a lot of great consultancy Um options out there. I, I, can, I can speak from, from East Ayrshire because I'm in East Ayrshire, I don't know the rest of the local authorities, but for example, um, when we first decided we wanted to, to tender for local authority contracts, uh, East Ayrshire told us about a consultancy uh, for tendering. So it was, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it was um, a scheme they had. And they said that they couldn't help us with a specific tender. However, they could pay for a consultant for a day to come and tell us, you know, this is what the system is, this is what to expect going forward. And uh, we were able to get a good understanding of that. And I think that was in 2019, so a couple of years ago. But, you know, that, that was really valuable for us to understand the fact that, you know, it's, it's not just all price conscious. There is these community benefits coming into it and there's various other ways to do it. So it really got us thinking and, and gave us the opportunity. So, yes, it's, I mean, it, it, it's certainly not easy. I think there's a lot of things that can be improved on. Um, the length of the tender is significant. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate now to have, a big team around round about me, so I could sit in the office for those two weeks and get that tender in. But uh, but you know it's 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 achievable, um, and I would recommend that people have a serious look at it if they're able to do so. That's brilliant, Lucy. What's your perspective? Um, yeah. So, so the the question was how how can farmers get involved, right? Um, yeah, we've covered the why. Um, but yeah, as Bryce said, you know there there is a lot of support out there so I'd say in Scotland um, we're here food for life um, can can help with that even if it's just a conversation or to kind of bat around some ideas um, I think that that's the the main thing is just to start talking about it start exploring it um, even if you know you don't end up doing it or if you if you end up doing it in five years time I think that's the that's the first thing is to just start actually exploring if it could work for you um, so that is what most you know of my role is, is talking to lots of different producers um, and suppliers to see if it's if it is right for them if it's going to work for them and to find them opportunities with local authorities so um, that's the first step so you know we're always here to support with that but also the links I put in my in my slides um public contract Scotland um and also this supplier development program offers a huge amount of resources which are all free um and they do um 
kind of courses on tendering and lots of different events. There's a lot of meet the buyer events all around Scotland. I realise this is very Scottish specific and some people might be in England. Um, I'm sure there's uh, there's lots of things in England as well. Yeah, there definitely are. Um, so I can I can try and signpost to that as well if anyone has any specific um, kind of requirements. But yeah, I'd say seek out that support that there is out there um, and just start exploring the options because it really varies depending on your product and your you know the area that you're in and what you want to do if you want to supply a couple of schools or a whole local authority or the whole of Scotland. So every kind of every situation is different I suppose but it's yeah the, the first thing is just take some action and start asking people about it. Here's a question that maybe you already answered through your presentation but it's quite technical and so I'm absolutely at a loss. Uh, the question is if dynamic procurement has been trialed or implemented in Scotland at all. Mm -hmm. um, What's dynamic procurement? In... I'm sorry could you explain that as well? Yeah so um I know that you know the Open Food Network, Anna. Yes, yes. Um, okay. So that is a great uh, example of dynamic procurement. So um, that's really a great one for anyone to check out if you're interested in dynamic procurement. But it's basically uh, a system which allows um, suppliers to engage with their buyers in a more direct way. Um, I'm probably not doing this justice. I'm not an expert on dynamic procurement either, but it's um, it's designed to... to kind of build shorter supply chains and also it's dynamic in nature that it can the demand and supply can can change and that gives the flexibility to the people who are buying it but also supplying it so this is something that works really well um, and I know was used a lot during COVID when kind of farmers markets had to find another way because everything was shut down and so they went online um, and Open Food Network helped a lot with that um, allowing those, those growers and their suppliers to still access their markets. So it hasn't been used yet in Scotland in public procurement. It has definitely been used in England. Um, it was used in the Southwest um, with school meals, with a, with a caterer there, um, and it was very successful. And I think it's definitely something that is mentioned a lot, and I hear a lot of it, and that could be a really useful uh, mechanism to allow more suppliers to get involved in public procurement. So I think it's something that, you know, is probably going to be a big part of the future in public procurement and already is being used and trialed in lots of different ways. But as of right now, it is not being used um, in Scotland, but I'm sure that it, it will be soon. <laughs> Great, thanks, uh, Lucy. Final question from the audience, and I think we're going to be hitting the, we're going to be a little bit over the hour, which was sort of our initial goal, but I think it's fine because uh, it's an interesting question. And again, it can be for both of you, I guess. Uh, the question is, if there is much interest from local authorities to source local food for other institutions, for example, hospitals, care homes, and if there are any good examples. So if you can answer that, Lucy, that'd be great. But then it would be interesting to know if Bryce would be interested in um, sort of like sourcing to other uh, public institutions, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So we're talking about school meals today because that is currently what the Food for Life Scotland program is working on. But um, you know, we're fully funded by the Scottish government in um, cycles. So this previous, uh, this current cycle is all around school meals, but previously the programme has worked in hospitals, in care homes and has explored other sectors. So that's definitely something that we want to do again in the future. Um, so kind of watch this space on, on that. Hopefully I'll have some, some concrete news um, on that uh, in the next year, because, you know, it's, it's a huge it's a huge market and it's so valuable so yeah I think looking at other um, local authority settings is very valuable and we're really talking about the food that is being bought with public money and as much of it, of it as possible should be coming from local um, farmers so yes definitely keen for that um, I haven't got any any kind of examples of where it's happening right now because we're not currently working in that area but um, yeah hopefully we will be soon. That's great. Bryce, how about you? Uh, yep, I mean, just to, to back up everything Lucy said there, um, you know, uh, we, we fully believe in trying to have these shorter supply chains, um, working more with local communities. Um, but again, I mean, the, 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 
so it's something fantastic happened to our business last year and that um, when we started working with Food for Life and started to realise the, the power of public procurement and sort of trying to change our business to, to be able to get into these markets, we actually attracted quite a few different, the diverse type of businesses. So um, there is a, a hospital locally that we supply. So although it's an NHS hospital, it's run by a private company, so, which I didn't realise even happened until we started this sort of journey. Um, so basically NHS pays this company a, a, a sort of management fee to run the hospital. Um, and, but because it was a private company, they were able to source milk from us direct without going through the public procurement process at that time. So that sort of gave us a, a sort of vision of how to supply these larger businesses. Um, the same thing happened with a couple of universities and colleges in Glasgow, um, and then we're into a couple of offices as well. So, I mean, just to, to, to sort of just say what Lucy was saying, you know, it's, it's good for local authorities and local, much larger uh, local businesses that are perhaps run by bigger establishments to be able to support these local and smaller, uh, smaller footprint companies. Um, so yes, I mean I think that it, a, a small business can be very diverse and supply into these different markets, and then give the, the money back out to the local community, which keeps the, the local economy thriving. Because I mean, just to give you an example, we've got twenty five people working here now, and the entire wage bill is funded by money coming from a hundred miles of us, you know, from all these different diverse people and businesses and and the local authorities of the supply. So it's really driving the local authority. So but whereas. Other than that, there could be milk coming from all over the UK to get into hospitals and, and offices and things like that. So it's, it's really great to be supported by the local community and keep the food supply local as well. That is a really strong example of community wealth building, the concept of community wealth building, and it's actually happening, you know, in practice uh, with Bryce's business. I'm going to just go rogue and ask if anybody wants to ask their questions directly or you have any comments that you would like to um, share before we end. So if you do, I see that Tara has her hand up. So go ahead. You can unmute yourself and go for it. Hi, um, I just wanted to say this was this was really interesting. I've just been I've been re working on the um, Land Workers Alliance response to the local food strategy consultation and I've been writing about Moschill as a good example of, they have a whole pillar on local procurement and things like this so this was it was really great to hear more about it than I've been able to find from googling um so yeah I'll feed, feed that into into what I'm putting in the response um yeah this was it was really interesting thank you thanks very much <laughs> lovely to hear that's so cool I don't see any other raised hands I see that Chris was uh, saying that it was a good presentation. And just to close, I was, this is sort of like just out of nosiness, I guess, but what has been the response both from the community and the local council? Have you had any feedback yet? Or is it too early days to know how they're feeling about the whole process? Uh, yes, we, we have we've had a lot of feedback. Um, well, the well, local community was, uh, was, was quite amazed at the fact that we were able to, to get into these contracts. Um, with a lot of people who, do remember school milk from sort of 30 and 40 years ago. Un unfortunately, they generally, generally remember the milk being frozen and then heated up in radiators and then been forced to drink it. So, um, so I think that's a, a bit of a welcome change for them. Um, but yes, we've had a, a lot of feedback. Um, and I think surprising feedback was yesterday during, during that meeting that we found that, uh, well, you know, that the council had decided to back us again and, and use us for the nursery milk as well. You know, they were saying that they were very happy with the service and the idea that it was plastic free and you know, it, it started a lot of conversations within the council as well. Um, so we were really delighted with that. So yeah, it's been it's been very positive for us. Um, we, we are a business, I will, I will learn up to it, we're a business that does get some negative feedback as well. Um, being a dairy farm, we obviously get the, the very negative PR from animal rights activists and, uh, and, and groups like that. Um, so with a lot of negative things directly aimed at us about you know, why we're not pushing for plant-based milks and things, but obviously that's well above our remit, it's not up to us for that. Um, and then we've also had, uh, we actually had a very large dairy go very publicly against us as well. Um, trying to dismiss for environmental uh, claims and, uh, and also threaten another council to say that they would perhaps consider pulling employees out of a, a local site because they're now backing smaller businesses and no longer backing bigger, bigger businesses. So we've, we've had that to deal with as well, which uh, was quite a surprise for us. Um, we didn't even think we'd been the radar of a multinational dairy, but <laughs> here we seem to be. So um, so we, we must be ruffling feathers somewhere. So. I was thinking that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, that's, that's the two sides that we've had, yeah. That's brilliant. Lucy, any final words? Um, no, I was just thinking it's quite ironic you getting those kind of threatening comments from a multinational when we know that the way that the food system is right now is because of these huge corporations have basically made it impossible for smaller farmers to make a profit. Um, so you've, you've tried to pivot the model um, to make it work and uh, clearly they're not in, not enjoying uh, a farmer taking back some power. So that's quite ironic. Um, but yeah, I, I know that We've we've heard really positive things from the from the local authority and the community. Um, so I know that they're really really happy with it. Um, yeah, final words from me, I guess. Um, it's been great to have this session and and discuss this um, in this environment. So that's really lovely. And just to say that if anyone has any more kind of questions or ideas about how to get into public procurement, then my door is always open. Um, so please do get in touch. Um, with me because I'm always happy to talk about getting more Scottish or local suppliers into school meals. Happy Lucy, can you put your mail maybe in the chat and then people can Yes, I will put my email address in it here. Well, Bryce has his final words. Bryce, you can say your final words and that's us for um, the afternoon. Uh, well, I don't know what to say, but... Uh, <laughs> you can fun. just say it was fun, that's it. You don't have to go into more detail. No, thank you. <laughs> If, if you want if you want to see a bit more about what we do um if you want to follow us on our facebook pages it was gill farm or our website it was gill farm as well so it's uh, that'd be great I think to I see had you it here really easy to copy so here we go people go and have a wee look there and thank you everyone for coming today i was just i know that I really enjoyed it i know that i didn't know anywhere near as much as i should have known about all the things so it was great 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 thank you so much and Bryce, it's so inspiring, and I'm desperate to have project cream from your farm, not any other farm in the world. So um, hopefully the milk is just as good. And thanks to you, Anna and to Ruth, who were helping us with all the technical side of things here today. And yeah, you're free to go with 25 minutes to spare, people. So thanks for having come. And again, this has been recorded. So if you want to see it later, probably you can contact the team and find out more. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.